This conference will now be recorded. So just to let everybody know, probably should have said done this before, but we do record the conferences because there are a lot of people each week who listen to this. They can't get to the meeting. And some of the guys who are on here like to listen again later. If any of you have issues and you don't want to be identified, just send me a quick note in the um, chat window uh, right now, and I'll make sure we don't use a name. Um, if you're all comfortable, we will move forward. Um, so, Dr. C, is that okay by you, or would you rather we don't use your name? I'm mute. I'm mute. Yes. You can call me Carla. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So um, I've got a few questions that I'd like to ask you. And then after that, we'll come back and um, have a chat with the group. So first of all, um, those on the call, this is um, Dr. Carlos Sueta, who was introduced to me earlier this week by Skip and um, another friend of Skip, Harrison, who have been friends of ANCAN for a very long time. Um, and um, Carlos happens to live in Tucson. And we have plans to get together pretty soon. Um, Carlos, how old are you? I am 62. Okay. And uh, when were you first diagnosed? Uh, five, five years ago. Five years ago. So, um, okay, 2016. And do you recall what your Gleason and your PSA level were at the time of diagnosis? I uh, had a Gleason of uh, 4 plus 4 and on biopsy 4 plus 5 and uh, PSA about 30, I think, is when it started. Okay. And um, where were you diagnosed? Um, at a hospital here, a urologist? Where, 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 where were you diagnosed? Allergy uh, in biopsy. Okay. Um, sorry, did you say Arizona urology? Um, all right. Um, before you started treatment, did they do any scans? Uh, yeah, it's, um, hmm. had a C, a plain C, um, had a bone scan, but, just, um, just a regular bone scan. <clears throat> okay. Not showed anything. Okay. And, um, what was your initial treatment? Uh, I initially got a shot of the garlics in March while we tried to visit uh, on, uh, an oncologist as well as radiology. Mm -hmm. And and a surgeon. So the surgeon talked me into it. Uh, and then ultimately, after we discussed it with those three different areas of medicine and with surgery, uh, I had surgery done in May. And uh, the surgeon was thrilled because a month later my PSA was zero, but really had no interest in hearing me tell him that the half-life of the garlics is so long that it's going to be six months before we actually see a testosterone <laughs> level that can know where we really are. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So his approach was, you know, you're, you're good to go, but we'll wait and we'll recheck you. And so we, we did. And so once my testosterone started coming back in the 200s or so, there goes my, my PSA of 0.3. Uh, might have been a little bit, a little bit lower, but still pretty low. So uh, at that point, uh, 
his uh, approach was going to be, well, you need to come back and get radiated. And so I pretty much pulled the reins back and said, look, why are you not having me go see oncology? And his response was, I can take care of you. Just leave it to me and you'll be on loop on forever. And I said, well, maybe that's not a, a, an option for me. I proceeded then to uh, an additional test that uh, forwarded that uh, in Phoenix, there was a guy doing sodium acetate studies and said, hey, you know, it's out of pocket. If you want to do it, go for it. I'll see you in a month when you start radiation. Got the uh, sodium acetate done. They found uh, one, uh, well, uh, on surgery, there was one lymph node uh, that was positive out of eight different mm -hmm. uh, chains. And then uh, on uh, sodium acetate, a different lymph node was found as well as one bone mess in the pubic ramus. So I said, all right, well, this changes everything. Uh, why are we going to radiate me from my xiphoid to uh, my thighs and beat everything up? So then I started looking around at, at what the options were and ultimately decided to go with proton. So I could limit the collateral damage. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did so that following uh, January. Um, in the meantime, got started back on a round of dead garlics followed by loop run that went mm -hmm. on for the following two years. Um, my uh, oncologist started me on Xtandi as well. And the plan there had been to go ahead and get radiated and then just basically throw the kitchen guy. Came back from that. He wanted to go straight into chemo. I said, no, you give me a month to uh, start feeling good again because you don't feel anything uh, for, for the first uh, you know, month of treatment. So uh, started chemo in April uh, of 2017. Uh, lasted four rounds. At that time, uh, are we are we discussing doctors' names here or not? If if you wish, we're happy to to hear them and give you feedback. Sure. So, um, uh, Dr. Almeida, who did the uh, sodium acetate test, uh, recommended I see uh, Dr. Uh, Scholz in uh, Marina del Rey, as well right. as uh, suggested the uh, uh, proton center in San Diego. Yeah, right. Uh, so, I'm going to see them both. And uh, that's how I got hooked up with proton component. Right. Uh, also, that's where we met Harrison. Um, yep, I got it. I, I, I don't remember names well, but I remember faces, and right now I'm going to figure, <laughs> figure this one out. Uh, so, at any rate, the uh, um, upshot was that uh, Dr. Schultz. Just a chemo following the radiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, since he practices in California and I live in Tucson, Arizona, uh, I came back to my oncologist here and said, Hey, uh, do you mind basically following the recipe of a different doctor? And if there's an issue, let me know. And then I've got two of you guys thinking about it. So he was good enough to 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 accept that uh, outside advice. Um, mm -hmm. Thought I was fairly aggressive about things, but as it was, that that's where I wanted to be. He uh, was able to get well. He he administered uh, doxetaxel, and uh, four rounds later, as my uh, side effects progressed and lasted longer, uh, I ultimately said, that's it, I've got to stop. So uh, with that, uh, I continued on, following that, I continued on with the uh, Lupron 
and uh, it blew up for 20, 24 months. Um, plus, you know, the big garlics episode uh, that kicked everything off, and then uh, expanded for 30 months, as well as uh, Exgiva quarterly. That's a recommendation of Dr. Schultz. Mm -hmm. So that is where I got to um, at the end of December 2018. Um, after my uh, first initiation into all these things, I was pretty beat up. And so uh, I pretty much said, hey, at the end of two years, I'm stopping. I need to take a break. And semblance of, of uh, feeling reasonably two-year uh, hormone holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, that went well until I had a recurrence. Uh, do you want me to give the whole, all the yeah, details? keep going, keep going. All right. You want, you want to hear the story? Here we go. Uh, so uh, last year, I went uh, uh, December 2018. Okay. Uh, over the ensuing six months, my testosterone came back into 300, 400s all topped out, at which point uh, my PSA started to rise again or started to show up. Um, I waited until it had reached a little, well, projected it to, to reach a level of two, uh, knowing that at this point I had gotten in touch with the folks at UCLA about getting PSMA studies. Mm -hmm. um, that being a, a, a pretty good cutoff to pretty much find everything. Although I guess now the cutoff to it's going to be even lower. Uh, that showed two new lesions um, this 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 past spring uh, of 2020. I don't know if I'm skipping some time there, but the uh, upshot being that one was uh, in the uh, I, had two, I, I, I had positive inferior margins on surgery uh, report. The right side had activated, uh, and the other lesion was in the right uh, iliac bone, well, just above okay. the hip. So I went back to uh, get protons. Um, the highest my PSA at that time was 3.1, just four proton, and dropped down to two over the last six months. Talking about now, uh, dropped down to two and then started to bump back up again. So uh, I happened to hit the exact week that PSA uh, was was uh, approved by FDA, the first of December and uh, managed to, to get get a scan done again, which now shows uh, multiple mass uh, okay. to different areas. So okay. uh, I'm back on hormones, uh, back on Exgiva, uh, back on Expandy. My PSA rose to 2.1. Um, and is uh, 10 days ago, point, 1.3. I've got my peripheral brain in the details. Unfortunately, the uh, loop has, Lupron has made me more stupid than usual. So uh, I, 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 I hedge sometimes as I'm speaking, trying to figure out what it is I'm trying to talk about. That's okay. Um, There's a lot of people who understand that on this call. Uh, so the plan is just to stay on these uh, three meds. Um, I, I still 
I'm looking to be more on the aggressive side and, uh, you know, just having regained my life um, that third year and actually feeling good last all of, you know, 2020 was uh, welcome. Um, but at this point, I know I've got to start dealing with those side effects again, uh, the, the loop on side effects. Right. Well, uh, let, let, uh, I'd li I just want to clarify a couple of little things. Um, first of all, when did you go back on hormone therapy this time, the beginning of December of 2020? Uh, January. Uh, okay. Yeah. Close enough for government work. And is, is um, Mark Scholl still your um, go-to uh, medonc? Yes. Yeah, I with him uh, because, you know, if anybody knows the latest things that are available, that he would be the one and has the most uh, yeah. I've found. I, uh, we haven't found anybody closer than him, uh, or in Phoenix necessarily looking, not, not, not necessarily looking, but there's nobody in Tucson that is just prostate. No, there's no, so, there uh, is no one in, in Tucson. I mean, I mean, Scholes is just fine. I mean, we also <clears throat> we also like Alan Bryce a lot and and Singh, um, um, Parminder Singh. Who, I, have you seen either of them at Mayo or not? Uh, no, my wife suggested Mayo, uh, but I, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of hedged on that, uh, having uh, <clears throat> having the input from uh, Dr. Scholes. From shows. And, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's good for now, my biologist that I had uh, went back to California, and right. the current guy is pretty much by the book unless there's data. He does. He, he's not going to be the first one to suggest it. I have to be the one that pushes it. So you're talking about. It. You're talking about your guy in Tucson. Your your Arizona. Your and your guy in Tucson is uh, where Arizona Onc or, or Arizona Blood and Cancer. Arizona Oncology, yeah. Okay. Um, was whether or not to, uh, well, was to, uh, to push a cuda. Um, the, so uh, let me, I, I have to repeat the, the genetics because nothing has ever shown a positive. And, yeah, I was uh, just going to, I was just going to, I was just going to ask you that. Have you, what genetic testing have you had done and, 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 germline and somatic or just germline yeah over the summer i had both uh, it was an a study that did uh saliva and blood so got them both uh that didn't show anything at that point um once i've had my recurrence i said all right well let's see let's see what shows up with the recurrence do i have some mutation that, that will now show and uh just got down with the guardian the Guardian, Guardian 360. Right. So, and did that show anything? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, as the meeting goes on, I can get the actual actual information, but it's a it's a HOL. Uh, mutation that, that's basically treated with a, a PARP inhibitor. Um, HOL, I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Um, See, well, so some of these, some of the mutations that are in the pathway um, and, and thought in the bracket pathway and thought to be treatable by PARPs are not really treatable by PARPs when you when you look deeper into them. So it, we, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, so I mean, yeah. I think that I think that's that's pretty much that's pretty much good. Do you have any specific questions for this group? Uh, well, yeah. Um, the uh, the additional. Genetic test that I had was a Keras study, 
Okay. Uh, all right. So that's the one that I'm talking about. Uh, I've got the paperwork here now in front of me. Um, so, um, so once we had once we had multiple lesions, I, I went back and said, "Look, you know, can we do a biopsy?" Let, let, let me let, finally let, agreed let, to do a bone let, biopsy. Let, let, let me just interrupt you because just for the sake of time, because we also want to get to skip. What did what did Karis show? What what mutation showed up on Karis? I showed a genomic LO. Say that again, you broke up. Genomic LOH. 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 Okay. And and Herb, LOH is in um is in the BRCA pathway and no. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Yeah, I'm anyway. Let's let me let me, th let me yeah. let, so t tell us what your questions are. We I've got a couple of suggestions for you. And I you know, I'd like to talk a little bit and um but I want to leave enough time to speak to Skip before we go to the general meeting. What specific questions do you have for us, Carlos? Uh, my Guardian Guardian 360 ended up showing an FGFR2 amplification. Okay. And that that's a blood study, and uh, the recommendation there is using a nib, so or or Defenib or any of the multiple nibs are. are Suggests are under study. Um, there's also a P PIK3CA right. application, um, but the uh, you know the MSI is not good. Uh, it's never been um, all the usual part items. The BRCA's have never been positive. They're still negative on all the current current items. The uh, Tumor mutational burden is registering back with carries is low. Mm -hmm. So now I've got three different things. You know, do I pursue a, a, a PARP inhibitor, a uh, what I call a nib, uh, or uh, a kitchen? And to that end, I actually got in touch with the gal in, in UCLA who does a study to determine whether or not you are likely to have significant issues with Atruda. And I got apparently very, very low probability of having issues with it. So I may actually end up asking more than one treatment done. Okay, uh, so let, let, gonna, let me ask you, Carlos, why, what, did you say you were MSI, you were, uh, MSI high or not? What was the MSI rating you got? They, they, they've never they've never shown. It's, they've it's never shown. Been yeah. Right. All right. So specific, specifically, what are you asking this group? Um, should you stay on the treatment? Is your question, should I stay on where I am? Stay the course? Should I start something new? Is that is that the question? Uh, the question is whether I should uh, uh, be more aggressive than just staying the course of hormones for another 12 months and then seeing where we are. Uh, who, until who, I, until I who would, with SA, who would, who would like, right? Who would like to take? Who would like to take a shot at whether you think? Um, Carlos stays the course on hormone therapy and zalutamide, exgeva, uh, PSA at 1.3, or whether he dives into something more aggressive now, given given his background and given what we know about the mutations that have um, started. Herb, do you do you want do you want to kick off? Herb? You're muted, Herb. Sorry, I'll be, I'm on. So I guess the question is, how fast is your PSA writing? What is your doubling time? 
Well, right now it's going the other direction. I went from 6.1, uh, I peaked before I got started on hormones and I'm at 1.3 a month later. Then, but, you know, it, what, what, what I, I would say, that sounds pretty good. Okay. But it means but, you're, uh, still you're still responsive to enzalutamide. Correct. I'm, I'm, res I'm responsive. Yeah. So just it, to give you, know, you an idea of doubling times. Um, well, but if you're if you're not doubling and you're dropping, what more yeah. would you want? Uh, you know what? Just like we did it the first time around. If we're gonna hit it, let's hit it hard. Yeah, I think. You know, yes, you could hit. There are trials where they're combining various other hormone inhibitors with other drugs, but generally they're restricted to people who really are not responsive to enzalutamide or abiraterone. Correct. And so, uh, I've never I mean, I, I mean, if you them. ask, and, but, and what, and, and, and I bet you if you ask Schultz, he would say, Stick with it. Yeah, he actually suggested Keytruda in he addition did. to going. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've heard Schultz and Peter. Maybe I should bring you in. We've heard Schultz s suggest pembrolizumab before. I, hmm. We have some. We're not docs. We can only tell you what we've seen with other people. And and by the way. In fairness, I should tell everybody that Carlos is a doctor. Um, <laughs> that um, we have seen people respond poorly to anti PD ones that they've suffered from the side effects. This is probably why you did the study that 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 you did. Um, but we have seen it happen. Um, I, I there, there's no there's no evidence, as far as I know, that early um, pembrolizumab is beneficial. It may not hurt either. I would be playing around with a couple of other little things. But Peter, you're uh, P Peter, you're you're a uh, a patient now of Dr. Schultz as of this as of this week, unfortunately. Um, have you ever had any discussions with Turner? Did you ever have any discussions with Turner about pembrolizumab? Uh, yes, but um, it, it particularly came up because I've got some mutations that lean that way. Plus, another thing you might want to keep in mind is my MSI was low initially um, with a genomic test. However, last year when I had a um, an opportunity to do another uh, biopsy on some uh, metastatic uh, movement in my peritoneal. The, that time it came back with an MSI high, which is much more uh, amenable to, to uh, pembrolizumide. So I've not yet done it. Uh, I'm kind of in the same situation you are. I've done intermittent uh, hormone therapy on and off for six and a half years, all with prostate oncology specialists and so forth. But, uh, and I just did chemo last year. Um, I've got a different situation because I have actually, I've got a BRCA2 mutation genomic and I've got a a, um, a germline mutation that, uh, that leans toward Keytruda. But I'm like you, I'm hormone sensitive. I agree with Herb that, um, but if you can deal with with the uh, hormone drugs in the second line, and I'm doing it now. I've been doing it for over a year now this time. And um, I thought of going off of it again, but with the ability to travel and get PSMA tests right now, it kind of sucks. So I'm willing to just stay the course and do it. I'm thankful I'm still hormone sensitive. And the idea of throwing everything at it, I mean, you know as well as I do at this point in, the, in, this, in this disease, it's a management question. It isn't a curative question. So throwing very aggressive things at it right now isn't going to cure one, although there have been cases of, of Keytruda actually having miraculous results in a few people. But 
I don't know if uh, if I would do it at this point. I'm, I'm holding I'm holding off with that as well as a uh, as well as a PARP inhibitor. Those those are kind of my next steps. But I'm I'm gonna go with the fact that I'm still hormone sensitive seven years into this, and thankful for that. All right. I Hey, uh, Carlos, this is Mark Finn. I had a question. Did you say which uh, agency you were on that you had so much trouble with? Did you receive Lupron or whatever? Carlos? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I missed the last five minutes there. My, I, I... Okay. Do you know which ADT drug you were on? Yeah, he said he was on Elig he was on Firmagon followed by Lupron. Okay, because I, 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 the other thing uh, would be to I, try a different, L different ADT drug like uh, Trellstar, which I had better luck with Trellstar than I did with Lupron as far as side effects. I mean, the, the, the one thought that I have um, is... Uh, Possibly, if and you could probably get Schultz to do this, is to first of all to switch the enzalutamide to darolutamide. Um, I'm going to get Len to talk to you in a minute, but Len is on right now on monotherapy darolutamide. Peter's been on darolutamide for a while, and the side effects of darolutamide, when layered either monotherapy or when layered over LHRH, seem to be a lot easier and if you could tolerate the side effects that that would certainly make life much better um as to whether to layer anything else on on top here's my concern with this that the more you layer on the more you're likely to morph the disease and when you morph the disease it's harder to treat i was i had a a long chat on other issues, basically, with, with Dr. Elenia Staff, F. Staffio this morning, who's, who, who just left MD Anderson. She's, she's a terrific GU med on. One of the things she told me is that men who were given early dutasteride and early finasteride and finished, tended to finish up when they did get diagnosed with prostate cancer with Gleason 9s and Gleason 10s that they found that, and, and I'd never heard that before. And the problem is, it doesn't apply to you personally, but the problem is these, this disease is so smart that it does morph and it does respond to the drugs you're giving. And oftentimes it can make it less treatable in the future. So if you've got it well managed right now, we're never going to cure the disease for somebody like you. The, the, the idea is let's manage it for another 20 years. And so that's why I, I don't know that if it were me, I would want to dive into an anti PD one at this point in time. Len, do you, do you or, or Peter, do you one of you just want to say anything about about uh, about darolunamide? Well, I can tell you, uh, Carlos, my experience that I've been on darolunamide for seventeen months now. Um, I'm down in Florida where the PSA detection is uh, or non-detectable level is 0 0.06. And I'm, by that standard, I'm not detectable. Uh, I've been on monotherapy since, um, well, if you count the washout period, since August of 2020. Um, since you talked about brain fog, uh, you may know that darolutamide does not enter the brain, doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier, so uh, you have greater mental clarity than you would with Xtandi or abiraterone or apalutamide or any of the others. Um, now, the, the difficulty is that um, technically you, you can't be uh, metastatic uh, to get darolutamide, you have to be non-metastatic and castrate resistant, and you are neither. Also, I uh, am neither. I was also 
uh, metastatic and hormone sensitive, but I managed to get the drug. I think it depends on uh, how hard your oncologist pushes for you to get it. Um, and I think it's a similar situation with Peter, that he doesn't technically qualify for darolutamide, but he is getting it. Um, the, um, oh yeah, now if you, <clears throat> we're noticing a, a trend that certain oncologists try to avoid uh, hormone therapy because they want to avoid the castrate resistant stage, which becomes, as Rick said, very difficult to treat and resistant. Um, such uh, oncologists as uh, Alicia Morgans, Chuck Ryan, and uh, Antonarakis, uh, John Hopkins. Um, those are three that I'm aware of who have, uh, you know, are sympathetic to this idea that let's try to use other treatment therapies other than uh, hormone therapy. So if you want to avoid the the, the hormone trap, if you will, uh, you might want to see one of those three, or at least you know get an opinion from them. Yeah, I mean, the, and the other thing I would say is that Peter Peter's with prostate oncology. My guess is that if you wanted to try darolutamide in lieu of enzalutamide, that um, Schultz is going to be able to get it for you. I don't know how they do it in that practice, but they they seem to be able to perform magic when it comes to getting some of these drugs. So um, I, I do think, and, and I, we, I'd be happy to connect you with the guys that are on darolutamide now if you, if you want to talk to them. I'm afraid we've got to move on because I still want to touch base with Skip. And um, we've got a lot of guys in the call that we've got to get around, but I'll see you and we'll talk some more. And I just hope that you can see there's so much experience in here and ideas and great ideas um, that we, we, um, we need to, you need to keep coming and, 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 and bear with us and we'll keep navigating you. There are, there are, there are options. Um, Skip, um, tell the guy, I should just say that um, Skip came first, I think, uh, became aware of Skip around 2015, I think. And, um, and we actually have met at PCRI. And um, I think Skip was on this call many, many years ago, one time. Um, and um, I managed to convince him to come back. And so here he is. So Skip, give the guys a, a quick idea as, of your um, of your status and where you are. Yeah, um, I'm happy to do that, Rick. Uh, uh, I was di I'm in I'm a San Diego resident, and I was uh, diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer in March of 2016. And I think it was just shortly after that, probably the summer PCR I, uh, session in uh, at the Marriott in Los Angeles that we met Rick okay. uh, for the first time. Um, and uh, initially, my PSA was at uh, about 14, 14.7. And uh, uh, I, I uh, got online and I hooked up with... Uh, uh, Team Inspire and um, met some people on Team Inspire who gave me a lot of really good advice and and one of them in particular referred me to uh, prostate oncology specialists and uh, spent a lot of time on the phone with me uh, uh, having gone through this uh, initial treatment himself and we talked about all the options and the alternatives as they existed at that time. So when I went to prostate oncology specialists, I was uh, uh, initially with uh, Dr. Turner and remained with Dr. Turner until he departed just uh, a week or so ago. And and I've had one meeting with uh, Dr. Schultz since. Uh, my uh, treatments began in uh, May of 2016 when Dr. Turner immediately started me on ADT. Uh, and uh, after my first uh, 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 treatment, it was with uh, Lupron and Casodex. And after one month, my PSA dropped to two. 
and then we decided that I would uh, go for radiation. It was a it was a choice between uh, um, a, a, a photon therapy or uh, IMRT at UCSD or proton therapy at what was then uh, the Scripps uh, Proton Center in San Diego. So I uh, I opted to go with the proton for the same reasons Carlos mentioned that the the uh, collateral the the risk of collateral damage seemed to be less with the proton therapy as the uh, the beam the pencil beam and 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 the targeted the ability to target the energy right at the tumor itself and so forth seemed to have benefits so I opted to do that and I I had uh, 28 fractions of proton therapy and the, depending upon where I, I my, my tumor was, uh, was uh, uh, there was no extra capsular ex extension for the tumor. It was about, uh, I think the largest dimension was about six, uh, 30, 33 or 35 millimeters. It was, it was, it was in the range of about an inch in size. Um, uh, and then uh, I so I went through the proton therapy. There was there was one potentially affected lymph node, and uh, so they did some targeted pelvic region with less grays of intensity and a high grays of intensity targeted at the, directly at the tumor. Uh, Thirty days following that, then at uh, Dr. Schultz and Dr. Turner's recommendation, I started on. Uh, a chemotherapy, and I think the reason for taking a really aggressive approach in my case was uh, Dr. Epstein in Baltimore had, had uh, uh, <clears throat> did the pathology on my tumor and identified uh, evidence of signet cells, and and I, I I think that kind of heightened everybody's interest in attacking it aggressively. So I went through. Uh, um, uh, as I recall, it was uh, six uh, six missions of taxidermy. Sorry, let, huh? let me interrupt you. For, first of all, what, what was your what was the Gleason that was identified? Oh, my 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 Gleason was uh, a nine four plus five. And what type of cells did did um, did Epstein identify? Signet. Signet cells. Okay. All right, and so you went through chemo. Um, and what year was this that you went through chemo? I, I, the uh, the radiation was in 2016, July through the beginning of September, uh, for 28 sessions, and then 30 days later I started the chemo. So that would have been uh, early October, continued through December. Had the sessions every three weeks. Okay, and, and then so I can, and then I had, and I continued on the uh, Lupron and Casadex for eighteen months. Okay, so that that um, that ended November thirtieth of two thousand and seventeen. So you finished. And, and, <clears throat> you finished up November thirtieth, two thousand and seventeen, and how correct. have you done since? Uh, I, my uh, PSA has been as low as 0 .0, <clears throat> 0 0.02, and it, it kind of bounced around a little bit, got back up to point, uh, point 0.7, and then uh, and then slowly came back down again. I'm not sure that there was ever an explanation for why it rose to point 0.7. Uh, then it just slowly came back down to, again and settled, was kind of bouncing around in the 0 0.2 range between 0 0.2 and 0.27. Um, and then uh, Dr. Turner put me on, uh, I continued to, I, the ADT was over, but I continued with, uh, um, What's that uh, sh uh, drug to control sugar? I, um, I can't think Metformin. of the name of it. Metformin. Metformin, yeah, I still continued on that. And then he put me on finasteride. And, uh, and that was very recently. And since the finasteride, 
my PSA has dropped down to 0 0.06. Yeah. Um, I had I had uh, I had uh, a, 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 a full body a scan, and I had a bones full body full bone scan, and and then a uh, MRI of the prostate and the pelvic area at the very beginning. I have not had any scans since, and there's been no. Uh, uh, no indications of any need for me to have scans, although although Dr. Turner and, and Dr. Schultz said if my uh, PSA were to rise, and, and they've, they've targeted between 0.5 and 1, they would probably send me to UCLA for PSMA. But so far, knock on wood, I like to think I'm uh, doing quite well and, and holding my own. Any any questions for this group, Skip? Um, I, I guess my question is, uh, at this point, would simply be if, if I'm if I'm not experiencing anything negative, I should just thank my lucky stars, shouldn't I? And uh, and I, and. Uh, and and hope uh, and hope what's happening is 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 going to sustain itself. Any anybody want to talk to Skip? Anybody want to respond to what Skip says? Well, I don't know. It sounds like everybody's in agreement. Anybody disagree that he should intervene and do something? I can't. I can't get these guys to say no. anything today, Skip. You know. No. All no. Of a sudden, I. I. Can, I. You know. I. I can. I consider myself really, really lucky. And and in in re, you know response to some of the comments Carlos was making earlier, I'm just mm -hmm. glad I we took a really aggressive approach right at the onset. Yeah. yeah. Rick, can I Indeed. just and ask? Yeah. What? what did everything? I'm sorry. Sorry, I. Have I have a question, Skip. What are yes. signet? What are signet cells? Uh, you know, yeah, you know. To tell you, to be honest with you, I don't know what they were. They were just described in the pathology report as evidence of signet cells. And I'm not. Okay. And I never really understood. I asked Dr. Epstein when I saw him at PCRI. I didn't even understand what he was explaining to me. So basically, it's a histological finding in a subset of adenocarcinomas where they find a vacuole pressing against the nucleus that looks at make like look like a signet ring. And there's yeah. uncertain the significance of it in terms of both diagnosis and treatment is very ambiguous at the moment that it, that many of them respond as we've heard here to treatment but sometimes they don't but at the literature i just did a quick scan of the literature and it's not there's no definitive association with signet cells and uh, outcomes thank you Anybody want to add, Carlos? Did you want to add anything about signet cells? Uh, you, you have no, we have no sound from you right now. Your microphone is off. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Mark. Anything you would add about signet cells? Well, in uh, most cancers, that would be a, a more well-defined cell, but specifically how they would behave in uh, prostate cancer, I really don't know. It's usually because the uh, cell is producing some sort of uh, hormone or protein uh, that forms that appearance. So, and specifically, no, I don't know in this case. Okay. Well, um, Skip, I would say whatever you've been doing, keep doing it, man. And um, we are 
also very happy to have you in the fold. And hopefully now yeah, you know, I, retired, we'll I, see more of you and hear more of you. Yeah, I retired on January 5th. So uh, yeah, I think I'll be around a little more, a little more often now. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, I think, I think a big help has been trying to get a little bit of exercise along the way and, and, uh, and uh, pay more attention to the diet, what I eat. And, and uh, yeah, just uh, being, being appreciative for life. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we haven't talked yet about diet and exercise we usually do on most of these calls if you've ever listened to the recordings uh that perked up jimmy g uh when when somebody said exercise he he looked up so um i think we i i, I we we may have one other person um i don't think we're gonna have time to get to them but um keith shields um is this the first time for you on the call Keith, you're muted. Uh, are you there, Mr. Shields? The name is a little familiar. I don't have time to look into my notes right now to see if I recognize, but um, I think you've been with us before. Um, so let me see. Um, let's run down. There's a couple of questions I have for some people on this call. Um, as a result of some meetings that we created this past week. Um, so I'm going to take the liberty of just briefly touching base on the call with those gentlemen. Um, but the most important thing I want to do is touch base with Jimmy G, who got a, I hope, got a artificial sphincter today. Jimmy, turn on your mic. He affirmative said, affirmative okay congratulations how are you feeling uh i'm uncomfortable but i'm fine okay i uh here at the johns hopkins uh, bed and breakfast it's pretty nice uh but uh, i can't shift around very much just really uncomfortable in the groin area and i have a feeling this is something that is going to pass very quickly i only have to have a catheter for a day as opposed wow. to when you have prostatectomy and you have to have it you know for much longer and wow. uh i'm so i'm so psyched about the possibility of not being heavily incontinent after a year and a half you can imagine that i don't really give a shit to be honest about what i have to go through get out of here tomorrow and wow. um see what happens so i'm, I'm excited thanks thanks very much um so so it went well i mean it's it sounds great jimmy i mean i, I just can't believe because i do remember when i've known other people get them they had to keep that caster in for a while so that that is um that's pretty exciting that uh, I, it, I hear it's not in very long that's what i hear okay and you know it's, don't it's it's not as good as sex i'll tell you the, the uh, artificial <laughs> urinary sphincter insertion is not as good as sex i can testify <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that bad. I came so, out Jimmy, when I came what, out of anesthesia. I was screaming when I came out of anesthesia, but that passed quickly too. Why were you screaming from pain? No, no. Yeah, pain and, only, and just I can only disorders. say, I can only say, Jimmy, we get used to what we have to. And don't we though? Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Good job. So tell I me, always, Jimmy. I, why I, I, I have a history. I tell you this real quickly. I have a history of coming out of anesthesia and acting crazy. Uh, when I had my shoulder surgery in 2008, one of them, I came out, this is honest to God truth, I was in the recovery room and I was screaming and cussing at the medical staff that I was James Taylor and they didn't know who I was and I had written Fire and Rain and I wasn't getting the respect that I deserved. That's a true story. <laughs> I don't remember it, but that's what they tell me. <laughs> anyway, does anybody want to ask me anything? I'll stop talking. You make me smile, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, Jimmy. Ketamine, Jimmy? Is that what? Uh, is that why you were hallucinating? What's that? Did they give you ketamine when the that last? No, time no, no, no. They gave me no. They, they. I think the before propofol, the stuff that unfortunately killed Michael Jackson. I theorize that the older general anesthesia, and you doctors will know this, 
I, I think it was harder to manage. I think it puts you under for a longer time. And, and propofol was kind of like the better mousetrap in general anesthesia. And I know that when I had colonoscopy, when I had uh, uh, propofol, I went out and came out so quickly that, um, and I had it for my other shoulder surgery. So I think that's it's probably, um, it, somebody t tell me if, if I'm on to anything, that it's an improvement. Because in the old days, it really, really was tough for me. It's for sure it's an improvement. Great. It's, it's very much, you know, the anesthesiologist has a much easier time managing depth of anesthesia. And once they stop infusing it, you come out. You metabolize it really fast. Great. That's what I thought. So I, I came great, out. And I can uh, tell you, it's a great sleep. I mean, it's one of the best sleeps ever. <laughs> it was a little too good for Michael Jackson, but, you know, it's really good. Um, let, let me let me ask the gentlemen who were on the call. Harry has gone, unfortunately, because I hope he would be here. But the gentlemen who were on the call with Harry, Jimmy, David, um, um, Jimmy, I'm just going to mute you for a second because we, we're getting there. You go. Thanks. Um, how no, easy, please. I'll be. I'll stay muted. Uh, okay, but I would like your feedback. How, David? How was the discussion about estradiol and and um, and Richard Wasserstein's experience, and um, whether are you going to pursue it with uh, Maha Hussein or not? I, I, I have some statements for you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for setting it up. It was quite interesting. The man to talk to for an hour. He talks really, really fast, and it's kind of hard to keep up with him. But the bottom line is, is that he's been on Estradel for 20 years and got off LHIH. And David, are you trying to talk to us? Yes, can you guys hear me? Barely. Not very well. It sounds, it sounds like the microphone's not in front of you. Jimmy, do you want to you wanna take over? Until David gets back on, tell, tell us what you learned from speaking with Richard Wasasug about estradiol. Yeah, the, the, I, I, I will, provided that you can actually hear me without too much noise, because if you can't, I will no, get off the good. video and no, call yeah, the yeah. phone. Is it okay? Yeah, you're good now. Okay, okay. I thought it was great. You know, I've, I really felt, uh, I was quite honored to be talking to Wasasug, to be honest. He is the guy that, you know, has a point of view and a lot of, a lot of stuff. He he hit me a lot with, uh, you know, sent me some stuff about his survey about, you know, intimacy and ADT and couples. And it had some wild stuff in there about our official, uh, you know, uh, prosthesis and stuff. And it was, it was a little bit uh, out of what I imagine I would be turning to, uh, you know, to regain uh, sexual function if, if uh, there was no success. But he's he's a dedicated guy and he knows everything about the estradiol. And it was so interesting to hear, as I thought, as just as I thought, that for a hot flash uh, solution, it makes total sense because it it's uh, of how it acts, and and it he says he just his both for both for uh, uh, testosterone suppression and for um, hot flash treatment, you use different dosages, but the idea is the same that you want it. You know, you want it high, but not too high. You don't want it too low or too high. And he explained it in a way that I'm not going to get into. But um, it's it's just really sounds like something that uh, has never even ha made a dent into being standard of care in the U.S. simply because it's dirt cheap and not profitable compared to the opposite end of the spectrum, which is what we have with LHRH. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong about that. Right. And Dave, David, um, did you? I think you're with us on the telephone now, right? Correct, correct. Can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, we hear you great. Do you think great. you're going to pursue it with um, with uh, Maha, Maha Hussein? I am, I am definitely going to explore it. I mean, and, and, and not only, you know, to get off the LHRH, but he said as, as far as the bone density issues that we all have from being on the LHRH, 
and he's been on he's been on the estradiol for twenty years. Yeah. And his PSA is, is is his PSA is very low, and uh, I think it's well worth exploring. And again, just like Jimmy said, he says it, it it's not prevalent in this country because the drug manufacturers are making so much money in Lupron that that they're not interested in really exploring it. Yeah. Did I say that right, Jimmy? Yeah, and you know, the more I find, the more I've been in forums and in our support group and everything else like that you know even though i worked hard and didn't have as hard time with 82 as some guys it is very very it's just bad you know that's what pianta said pianta just when i you know he said it's just bad there's no way to put it you know it does its job but it does a lot of damage and it's cumulative and everything that we know about it it's just a rough mf -er, that stuff Right. So to answer your question directly, Rick, yes, I'm going to talk to Maho Hussein about it and see what she says. I would, you know, I've been on, I've been on Lupron for about a 13, 14 months, and I think it's worth a shot. Okay. Um, Doc, Carlos, you have a question, but we, we, you, 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 we still don't see any uh, audio from you. Um, Rick, uh, this is Al Latimer. Um, on this estradiol thing, uh, Dr. Myers put me on estradiol 15 years ago because I hated the Lupron, and it worked. It worked well for over 10 years, and the side effects overall were much less. Gynoplastia turned out to be a really big issue, and I ended up having a double mastectomy because of it. But Overall, overall lifestyle, it's been much better than the Lupron was. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, we know about gynecomastia. I mean, to what extent um, radiation to the chest um, is effective? I should say radiation to the breasts is effective. Um, we're not sure, um, but uh, yeah, we, we recognize it as, be, as being an issue. Um, I, Carlos, are you with us at this point on the telephone? No. It's, it's not I can like tell you something while we're waiting. Uh, Wasserstein has a, a nice rack okay. and he could care okay. less. He showed it off. He didn't uh, lift his shirt up, but he said, this is the price I pay. It's worth it to me. He said okay. that. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I'm ready now. Go ahead. So you had a question, Carlos? Uh, actually, I'm glad this topic came up because that was one of my initial approaches. To be, um, once my PSA started going up until we saw that there was metastatic component. Um, but uh, with regard to the general concept of the estrogen, it actually did used to be used uh, previous to the onset of, of using uh, Lupron. And the reason they stopped was because it was being taken orally and that causes a lot of other issues, primarily cardiovascular and blood clots. However, if you uh, don't go past to the liver by taking a pill and use a patch, that is, uh, eliminates that particular component of having blood clots. Right. Uh, there's always uh, a component of the cardiovascular effects, and but nobody's ever quantitated that, and the issue became well, we've got something bigger and better. It's called Lupron. It's a shot. You don't have to take pills every day. Let's just go with Lupron. And so then everything went down the Lupron route. Uh, but the data is there for estrogen, and clearly one of our members here has used it successfully for years. Uh, I expected that to be an issue for me. And so a year ago, I said, hey, you know what? If I'm going to go on estrogen. Go ahead and just let's just radiate my breast so I can limit the gynecomastia. And so it does, uh, uh, radiation is there. And as I read through other uh, blogs, uh, really that's something that should have been offered to us because you will develop gynecomastia uh, just by being on hormone, uh, the LH inhibitors alone. Okay. Um I have, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which I think is also going to be of interest to a bunch of people here. Gary Peters, you 
had the opportunity to speak to um, my another very old friend of mine, Steve Brown, um, and hopefully correct some of the um, the misin I don't want to say misinformation, but correct some of the information you've been pro been provided by your physical therapist. Do you, do, you, do you want to talk about the possible use of electrostimulation to help you with incontinence? Right. The, the, um, the Stoller procedure um, that um, you had talked about and that Steve had had was a procedure that is more specific for an overactive bladder and urge incontinence and it involves um, an electrode on the tibial nerve which um, then connects to your spine so i'm um i'm not sure that that is pertinent to my issue which is uh stress incontinence um and not an overactive bladder um also in in that instance that's a procedure that my therapist says she can't do and is done in a doctor's office um so I can still explore that, but when when I've read about that procedure and when I talk to Steve, I think it's still more um, more designed for a different kind of problem than what I have. Okay, but he's gonna he's gonna check if. Um, if it's also intended for my issue. So we're going to talk again. And I appreciate you putting me in touch. OK. So um, guys, we've got 40 minutes left. Uh, we've got a lot of people on this call, probably somewhere around 40 right now. I'm going to move down very quickly. Um, if you think that your issue can wait till next week um then maybe um you can just tell me and we'll make a note so we know he needs to speak next week if it cannot wait we'll get to you and we'll continue for as long as it takes after the after the uh witching hour at uh, the top of this hour so let me start um and run through everybody very quickly jake anything you need to talk about tonight no sir herb anything for you no, I'm good. Thanks, Rick. Peter. I'll wait. Thank you. Al Latimer. You can wait. Okay. Um, Pat Martin, anything for you? I'm going to see my med on um, Friday, Thursday and Friday. It's going to run a maximum test, a couple of blood tests. Okay, see. hold on, guys. Hold on. I don't, please don't tell us it's either a yes or a no. If you want to speak and it's important, just say yes, and we'll come back to you. Do, you, do we do we, anything for you, Pat? No. Okay. John, anything for you? No. Okay, thank you. Joel, anything you'd like to raise? Joel, anything you'd like to raise? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Jeff, anything for you? Okay, thank you. Jeff, anything for you? Jefferson, anything you'd like to raise? Okay, that will take that as a no. Jim M, anything for Negative. you? Negative. I got you. Larry, Larry, anything no, for you? Oh, no from? thanks. Okay, Jimmy G, we spoke to. Um, Jim B, anything for you tonight? No, I'm good. Thanks, Rick. Okay, Len, anything you'd like to raise? No, sir. Rusty, anything for you? Did Rusty leave us? Rusty must have. Rusty might have left us. I don't see him. Okay. 
Um, Les, anything you'd like to talk to us about tonight? Not, not tonight, thank you. Okay, Jeff, anything for you tonight? Jeff Marchi? Jeff Marchi, are you still with us? Yes, you are. I see it, Jeff. I see you there, Jeff. Anything you'd like to talk to us about? <clears throat> okay, we'll come back to you. Oh, you're there. Go ahead. Anything for you, Jeff? I can now your microphone is on, but I don't hear an answer from you. No. Oh no. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Joe, anything that you'd like to raise? Nothing for me, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Kang, anything you'd like to talk about tonight? Don't hear anybody. Dennis Maguire. No, have, you, have you, no. start, have you started yet? Wednesday. Wednesday you start. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, next week, we definitely want to... Uh, so absolutely nothing, nothing, no updates, nothing. No update. I, well, I had a COVID test today and I was negative. Well, we don't need that. <laughs> um, okay, well, all right, we can't, we're all eager to hear what happens when the, you get that lutetium next week, Dennis, so we'll be, we'll be talking to you. Um, Frank, how are you doing this week? Uh, it's a better week. Good. But I, but I have, uh, but I don't have anything to add. Good. Have you been exercising this week, Frank? Uh, no, because of the cellulitis in my left uh, hand that has been uh, a bitch. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Russell, anything for you? Russell? No, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Sylvester, anything you'd like to say tonight? No, thank you. Okay. Mark, Finn. Mark F. Uh, yes, I can give you an update on my clinical trial if you'd like. That, thank goodness, because I was getting worried nobody would want to say anything. We'd have to close off at 7.30. So I'm very pleased. Thank you very much. Dr. Mark, anything for you? Nope. Uh, heading to LA next week, but all is fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, David Muslin, anything else you'd like to add regarding your situation? No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Uh, Bill Franklin still with us or gone? Probably gone. It's probably had to feed the guys. Um, Steve Linnett, anything for you? Don't see him. I think he may have left. Um, Jim J. Haven't seen you in this one for a while. Anything for you? Jim Jeffries, no, I'm fine. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Dennis C., anything for you? No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Keith um, Shields, are you there? Calling Keith Shields, are you there? You're muted right now if you are. We don't, we're not getting a response. Ken, anything for you? Ken Anderson. No, I'm good, thanks. Well, we've only got one guy, so we, we may finish up with a with all, but we're going to go back to Pat Martin because he's got an appointment this week. So let's start with Mark and then Pat Martin, and then we'll figure out who else. Oh, and Peter had something that could wait till next week, so we'll probably get to Peter this week. Mark, uh, you forgot Carl Foreman. Oh, my gosh. Mr. Davis. Yeah, you're right. I did. Sorry. Well, you, you didn't say. Oh, yes, you're right. I got you right here between John and Joel. Carl Foreman, anything for you? Yes, just to follow up what's in the chat that I post there. Okay. I can't. Hard for me to keep. Whilst I'm reading, I can't see the chat. Um, okay. So let's start. Nothing for, nothing for John I either. Oh, I'm sorry, John I. <laughs> no problem. All right. Let's do it this way. 
Have I missed anybody who has something they'd like to bring up? I know I didn't ask John A, John A either. Somehow or other, I got I got. Um, any That's anybody want to bring late. something up? Okay, I've, I've got a short short thing that uh, wouldn't take long. Okay, Peter. Um, let's let's start with Mark Finn. Mark, give give us an update on on where you get, and a real brief update on your background because there are guys that that won't know you from here. Okay, well, I was born in 1950. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I have. I've had meta I have metastatic disease. I had a prostatectomy in uh, 2015. Uh, since then, I've had pro I've had uh, chemo with uh, Taxotere, um, uh, as well as Provenge. Been on ADT, except for a small vacation for three or for about four months. I've been on ADT since then. Um, ADT is sort of I become castrate uh, uh, resistant now, and so I went through. Uh, uh, Abiraterone pretty much ran the course on that, and um, in the in between, I had one tumor that was significant enough that we did some SBRT on it, and uh, that was successful in uh, shrinking that tumor, pretty much eliminating that. Um, because I do have metastatic disease, I have probably yeah three or four uh, small tumors, mostly in my spine, um, and so uh, I'm going to enter into, so really doing additional SBRT is, as I say, it's whack-a-mole. You know, you just keep trying to go after it, but it doesn't really make sense anymore right now. Um, and so I'm going to go into a uh, uh, clinical study, which is a, it's a national study, but I'll be getting my treatment at the University of Chicago. Uh, this is kind of, I think it's called the ARROW study. Uh, but basically, it is a study in which I'll be and it turns out that I will be in the uh, two thirds that are the uh, treatment arm of the study. And I will be getting an infusion of a, I believe it's a proprietary small particle, particle with a PSMA affinity. And um, it'll be delivering, hopefully, uh, iodine 131, 1095 uh, to the tumor cells. Also probably to my, pituitary, to my salivary glands as well, but we'll see. Um, and then I also, uh, as part of the protocol, I'll also be getting um, PSMA uh, specific scans. And so I already had my first scan and they use the uh, uh, 18F DC FPYL. Uh, for those people who know it, uh, I believe that's the material that uh, UCLA is using. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where I'm at. My first treatment will be next Tuesday. So I don't think I'll have, I don't know. I don't plan to be on the call next Tuesday because I might feel like crap, but we'll see. Um, and um, but it was interesting. The I've already had the PET scan, and the PET scan really um, showed nothing uh, in addition. And my PSA level, I think, is around my last one was like five. Uh, so I think one thing, at least for me, it shows me that you know a PET axiom when you already have defined uh, tumors or lesions somewhere um, that it's probably good enough scan until you find something that really gets you in a better shape. And then once those lesions become uh, less, uh, less uh, severe, then you can think about uh, if you still have a high PSA level, looking at uh, uh, one of these newer PSMA-related scans. I think there's a tendency of many of us just to say, I want the most specific scan. And I think at least in my case, I'm very comfortable not getting that, even though it's part of this uh, clinical trials uh, protocol, because you know, there's already plenty of targets. So once we get rid of all those and it becomes a mystery why I still have a high PSA, then I'll figure out what to go after. But Mark, didn't you just say that you did get an 18F? Um, yeah, I did. PSA I did, but it's just what happens, the results of that really were no different than what I saw with my pet axiom. I'd had right. a pet axiom uh, in uh, January. Uh, uh, the pet uh, axiom was pretty much the same. It didn't identify new lesions or new sensitivities or anything else. So um, did you get a regular bone scan? Did you get a regular uh, PET scan? Yeah, yeah I, got a, I got a CT scan plus a regular uh, bone scan is part of the study. It's a CT scan, a bone scan, and then the PET scan. I had already previously got it uh, before I got into the study in January, early January, I got a PET vaccine scan. Mark, 
let me just okay, finish, let me let me let me just finish okay. my thought, please, please, Herb. And all the scans were concurrent, right? That's pretty okay. much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. The scans have all been concurrent. Uh, they, you know, I think that they. Uh, the nice thing is that the, um, you know, the bone scan uh, shows that there's a leisure, uh, areas of high, you know, activity, and then the PET scans, both from my PET axiom and then my uh, the other 18F uh, scans show that yes, they were uh, pretty definitively, um, uh, definitively seem to be prostate cancer. Interestingly okay. enough, I've been having a it was a, it was very interesting because I at least for me, maybe for you, we'll see, uh, <laughs> is that I had been having a pain in my jaw for some time, which I thought, you know, is that prostate cancer? Is that mandibular necrosis? Whatever. I had a tooth that we uh, uh, did a re redo on the root canal, and it's just been nagging me. It's not like severe pain and so on. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the bone scan showed that there was an area of inflammation there. Uh, so we're working that. But then when they looked at all the PET scans, uh, the PET scans showed that they thought that there was no reason to believe that that was bone cancer, uh, uh, prostate cancer at this point. Yeah. Um, May change in the future, but for right now. Um, Mark, I guess I just want to say what, ask, just follow up what Rick said. So basically this trial makes sure that you don't have any lesions that are not PSMA positive before they start. Is that um, correct? You know, I don't, I don't, um, I think they look at the different levels and they can then determine that because there's consistency, I think they can make that conclusion. Uh, but I could always have lesions that don't show up on any of them if they're very small. So. Does that, that answer your question, Herb? Well, it does because it's, I mean, it's the same thing as a glutetium trial. It basically it won't work if if you have any lesions that are not PSMA positive. Yeah. Well, I think the thought is right now that the lesions that we have are PSMA positive. Uh -huh. Right. And the other thing is I had the same thing with the jaw pain. And I just when I was diagnosed and I thought this was it. And then after all the diagnosis, it turned out to be a sialolith. What's just, a sialolith? It's just an inflammation of a salivary gland. Oh, okay. And that might be, we're kind of, in, I'm on a new regime of heavy duty drugs, uh, antibiotics, and we'll see what takes care of it. But there's a pretty, my looking at the results as long as, the, as well as the physicians is that this doesn't seem at this point to be related right. to my cancer. So I, what I just put in the chat window, a link to what, what I, considered to be a really good article um, by Alan Edel on salivary glands, um, the, the impact of these radionuclides on the salivary glands, yeah. lutetium, act, actinium, etc. Um, and he has even suggested some pretreatments, which you may not may not be available to you in the trial. But I do recommend you read that article. It's just click on the link. For those of you, I think yeah. everybody knows how to get to the chat window. I should have said it at the beginning, but it's the little bubble at the top. But definitely after the meeting, Mark, take a look at that. And also we can connect you to, um, to Alan Adele. He's on our advisory board. He's happy to talk to you. And, and Carlos, we can also connect you to Richard Wasasug if you like. He's on our advisory board too. So, well, I'm, um, I'm, yeah, that's that's great information, Rick. I'm fairly certain that um, dry mouth and other kinds of things I'm going to expect because this is a you know PSMA affinity poly, uh, molecule. It's very small, so because there are some PSMA proteins in the salivary glands, I'll expect to have some impact there. Yeah, but he's got some he's got some protocol there where if you if you can get some type of a treatment, pre-treat with some type of something, it kind of blocks up the, I'm not sure if it blocks the small molecules from the big molecules or the big molecules from the small molecules. Is that, Len, can you help me on that, on this, uh, on, on Alan Edel's salivary treatment? Do you remember? I thought that they were treating <clears throat> the salivary gland with iodine, pre-treating. Oh, maybe that was it. 
to well, I, I am gonna I am gonna take a pre-treatment for iodine, but I thought that was mostly, and I might be wrong, geared to protect my thyroid, not to protect the pituitary. I mean the salivary glands. But. Yeah, I think it's for both. <clears throat> Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, Mark, any particular reason why you went with the iodine radio tracer rather than uh, lutetium? Well, is lutetium you? It, lutetium is more specific for BRCA, isn't it? No. No. Okay. Specific for PSMA, avid prostate lesions. Okay. Uh, simple answer is I did look at the lutetium. Um, and it just turned out that in this particular case, um, this study, which is a, you know, a national study that was being sponsored at UFC, and that's where I was getting my treatment. And so it seemed to make sense. So I decided to do that instead of the lutetium. Well, it's a matter of probably, you, uh, I did some study you. on it, but at the end of the day, I, I determined that it seemed to be more, um, it, it seemed to be more a matter of convenience for me than anything else, but I didn't think that the lutetium, at least now, has been uh, shown to have significantly different, uh, better performance. Well, we've got Mark starting next week on iodine, I-131. I is well, iodine, right? Iodine-131? Yeah. And we've got Dennis starting on lutetium-177. Dennis, you could have done the iodine study, and then you could have gone over to the business school to, to for 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 uh, old time's sake in between treatments. Take some night classes. <laughs> exactly, you would have been right there, perfect. You know, and you'd be going back every every six week, every three weeks or six weeks or whatever it is, just in time for midterms. Um, okay. Hey, just. Um, uh, just one point on the salivary glands. Uh, as part of my screening, um, I had to do a number of tests and had some scans of my salivary glands to make sure that they were working properly and that they were excreting um, the uh, injected uh, solution. So they, I don't know if you did that with the iodine trial. Mark? No, I, I mean, uh, where I, most of it, I think that I, although I'll have some of my saliva, most of the material, although they're, you know, with the PSA affinity, it may turn out I get more out of my saliva than I think. Um, but most of it I'm going to excrete or um, go, comes out through the sweat. Well, guys, please keep coming back and please keep us up to date on these two trials. I think we we I think I can safely say everybody wishes you both the very, very best. And I think we're very fortunate to have two gents going through radionuclide trials that hopefully will share with us how they do. Um, it's just invaluable. It's invaluable um to the people that listen into this and and we are also really pleased that you you got into the trials because it ain't easy we know that um pat martin what is um you're going to see your um doctor this week at um isn't it at uh at, at seattle cancer center right and um what um question do you have anything you'd like to ask this group um bounce off of us before you get to the dock has anybody been involved or know of anybody involved in the oreo trial remind us which is the oreo trial uh isn't that that's even... a screening trial right isn't that a screening trial with right. oreo the oreo trial was the initial radiation localized radiation therapy of metastases out of hopkins yes okay. and i think and it's pretty much over uh, the current trial that they starting again is called the ravens trial ha 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 right uh so yeah. it's also at hopkins 
but I don't know how far along the Ravens trial is. And since since the Oriole trial was successful with uh, I I don't know the pronunciation, but oligometastatics. Uh, right, oligometastatic disease. So when you have relatively okay. few metastases, they would irradiate them. Yeah, and it was very effective for it. So when does that become a standard of care? Uh, I think there's still dispute in the field okay. because it's not long enough. Okay. And I know the study that I was going to try to get into up at uh, the University of Washington, it was closed. And I, I was... think what we, what we... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Anyway, so we'll go in with an maximum scan on Thursday. And then mm -hmm. on Friday, uh, I'll go in for a blood test, see my medonc, possibly get Luprin. And then on my chart, um, another blood draw is, as they call it, a blood draw for injection. So it sounds like they're going to take another, uh, more than just a sample, but they're going to. Uh, take some blood uh, and go with it from there, whether they try to treat it with T cells or whatever they do for immunotherapy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I got is on my notes, blood draw for injection. Mm -hmm. So um, is this part of a trial, Pat? Do you know if it's part of a trial? No. The trial that uh, Evan Yu was running and uh, Dr. Schweitzer was involved in it also. My PSA doubling time was uh, two, two months. Every two months it was doubling. They wanted your doubling time over three months. So it excluded me from that trial. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, uh, Schweitzer was gonna put me into the same, use that trial as a standard of care. Um, but I don't know what he's got going right now. So, so let, let, let me just clarify. So what you, you're going to get an axiom in scan, first of all, correct? Correct. And what is your P what, remind us again what your PSA level is, Pat? It'll be about 1.5 when I take it. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's going to give you a pretty good reading. And then you're going to consider whether you should do spot radiation, spot RT, right? Right. So, you know, the the interesting, Joel, um, you're still with us. Um, how, I, I want to come to you momentarily because I know that um, Dr. Antanarakis is one of the people that kind of likes the idea of spot radiation, thinking that he's, that maybe there's an, um, uh, there's a systemic effect, there's an ablative effect. Um, and ab abscopal effect, I'm sorry. Um, but we don't know, it isn't really standard of care at this point, but do you want to comment on on uh, your conversations that you've had with Dr. Antalarakis and using spot radiation? And using spot radiation? Well, um, I'm not sure that he can measure the scopal effect or can I, but if you we're having trouble hearing you, Joel. We're having trouble hearing you, Joel. We're getting a lot of feedback from you today. We're getting a lot of feedback from you today. And you sound like you're at the end of a tunnel. You sound like you're at the end of a tunnel. Can you hear me better now? Marginally. Marginally. Okay, how about that? Well, um, I'm probably using the wrong audio. 
Well, let me come back to you in a moment. It sounds like your mic is okay. picking up, and what we are getting is a lot of feedback. How about now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Much better. Uh, chose the wrong microphone when I went in. Okay. Um, yeah, Anton Arrakis um, um, believes that, uh, uh, of course, ADT, uh, if you can at all possibly do without it, he will. Uh, and uh, the escopal effect worked for me uh, part of the time. He said the escopal effect could last from uh, one month to uh, 24 months. Mine lasted for about eight months, and then uh, my PSA went back up. Um, and uh, the uh, verdict now is that he'll give me a bonus. If, if it goes up again, I'm at 1.0 right now. If it goes up again, he's going to uh, give me a CT scan, bone scan, and PSMA PET. Um, and uh, I read an article today um, that said that the Polaris test uh, can check if you have, um, if you're, uh, if ADT will work for you or will not work for you. So this is something I didn't know about the Polaris test. Maybe you guys did, mm -hmm. but it was a brand new, brand new article that I read today. Um, and uh, but anyway, the Anton Arrakis is uh, is believes in the escopal effect. Yes. Is there anyone else that wants to give your two cents on the, the whether spot radiation is um, is a is a a good option for oligometastatic disease? Uh, Eugene Kwan at Mayo is a huge advocate of it and has been for years and still to this day practices it. Less less could probably testify to that. There, there's some, uh, they used to say that um, the spot radiation provided no overall survival whatsoever in prostate cancer. However, I've uh, seen a couple of videos recently by doctors who uh, claim to have studied it, and they say it does provide for uh, a longer overall survival. Mm -hmm. So I think things are changing. It was not studied very much before. Uh, Rick, as you know, my oncologist Pienta is a big fan. Yeah. 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 Any 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 other feedback for 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 Pat? Uh, and Pat, you if I'm not mistaken, you are on Lupron, you are on Abiraterone right now. Is that correct? No, I've had a vacation. Uh, okay. It lasted about four months before my PSA uh, uh, started back again, and now it's doubling every two months. Okay, so you so you're going to make a decision with, um, with um, Dr. Schweitzer as to whether you're going to what you're going to do next at this meeting. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Any any other input for, for for Pat, because it is a pretty critical. Not on ADT right now. There are options, different options. Len, you want to say something? Yeah, Rick, uh, unfortunately, Joel just walked away. I wanted to ask him a question, but maybe you know the answer. Uh, he said the abscopal effect worked for him. So I'm wondering when he, uh, here you go, Joel, when you were, when you had your spot radiation, how many lesions did they target and how many did you have? I only had one lesion and they targeted one and hopefully they got rid of it. Um, so. Okay, so I wouldn't call that an abscopal effect. I mean, they just, you only had one lesion, they targeted it, and it gave you eight months of uh, PSA uh, decline. Correct. But that uh, abscopal would be if you had five lesions, they targeted one, and all five disappeared. Ah, that I didn't know. All right. Yes, I, we, I think we talked about a trial that was like that last reported at the GU meeting, where they, uh, no matter how many lesions you had, they radiated two. Hmm. And and as I recall it, they they were they did not find an abscopal effect. Is right. that right? Right. Right. But yeah, that it's still very be... controversial. A lot of a lot of uh, oncologists or radiation oncologists don't buy it. They don't believe it, but right. Certainly, the ones I've talked to don't buy it. 
Right. Um, you know, uh, Mark Perlo is putting in the chat window, I see about treating the primary. I mean, in this case, this is recurrent disease, Mark, where the primary has already been treated, as opposed to a situation where you're, you're de novo metastatic and the and the primary and you've never had treatment of the primary like somewhat like herb or ken anderson or something like that it's a slightly different situation here um well look i think we've managed to confuse you even more pat is that <laughs> no, right <laughs> no it, i some of the things that was uh, found in that oreo trial i find very interesting and I'll have to look back through my notes, the study that Evan Yu is uh, doing at the uh, University of Washington. Uh, it involved focal radiation and uh, ADT. So mm -hmm. we'll go from there. I mean, I don't think the Oreo trial had ADT. I think that was the, one of the things that was not part of the Oreo trial. Right, okay. Okay, Pat. Pat, if if the uh, if the scan doesn't pick up anything tomorrow or whenever it is, yeah. would you considering consider getting a PSMA scan down in San Francisco to, to a little more specific? If you don't see anything on the uh, Axman scan, I might I might I'll talk it over with him and see if it'd be worth it. I don't mind a road trip. I'm only 600 and oh maybe 700 miles away from it i don't right. mind that trip. i used to commute that i, I know lynn lynn had experience with that with an oxman scan that didn't really show much but is but the psma scan did so uh, i see uh, particularly below two it um it, it happens yeah Go i ahead, could wait until the first of april and my psa would be two then <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that reminds me, Rick, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask Mark Finn. Uh, he said there was no difference between his Axiom scan and his uh, PYL scan. Uh, so what was your PSA at that time, Mark, Mark Finn? Well, my PSA, I don't know what it is today, but my PSA since the first of year has been around five, five and a half. And the PSA is... I'd have to go check, Len. It's a good question, but my PSA has pretty much been the same since uh, oh, okay. uh, January, since the first test. Yeah, so we might not expect much of a difference when your PSA is that high. Axiomen will do just as good a job mm -hmm. as yeah. uh, PSMA PET. Yeah, yeah, and and that's partly my point because you know some of our discussions, and I understand it, but folks who have metastatic disease. Um, if they they often say well you know I, I need to go to ucla and get the most exact uh test and i think there's times when that's warranted when you particularly when you can't really find the source of the psa what might be the source of the psa um in my case where I, the axiom axiom uh probably showed us enough um, i was interested in getting the uh, psma affinity uh, scan because it sort of gave me a, uh, another level of confidence but it didn't really and you know, increase my knowledge of what where I am with my tumors. Okay, does that make sense? Len? Yep. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're gonna we're gonna go. Peter has something very quick, and then we're gonna go to Carl. Peter, give us your quickie. Well, it's a little bit ex existential, and it uh, doesn't really apply anymore. But <laughs> I've I've done um, intermittent three times. I've been on and off, on and off. Each time I've had recurrent disease and each time I've <clears throat> had a treatment to uh, deal with that, whether it be radiation or chemo most recently or whatever. <clears throat> uh, and I'm on darolutamide <clears throat> and I'm not thinking of going off that, but uh, last week or the other day I had a, um, I got my three month Lupron shot. And before it, I was considering delaying the Lupron shot for a month or two. You know, letting it go for four months or five months and then going back on the Lupron. And, and um, I know it's not intermittent. It wouldn't let my testosterone come back. But has anybody ever tried that? I mean, it's it's kind of, um, or is it just messing around where I shouldn't be messing around? Um, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to go on intermittent, but I'm just saying what happens if I put off 
put off the Lupron sometimes and go longer and get a little bit of uh, some kind of recovery. I don't have terrible side effects. I'm, I'm tolerating it pretty well, but what happens? Has anybody ever tried that going four or five months on a three month shot? Well, f first of all, let me say you're still on your darolutamide. That's not changing. Right. Right. So I'm not thinking of going on intermittent. I'm just thinking of delaying, delaying ADT. Well, look, Len, I mean, this, this is this is down your alley. Well, Len, Len and yeah. I have talked about it. Yeah. He, I talked to Peter. He knows my views on this. Well, share them with the now that it's been open to the call. <laughs> share it with the call, please. Okay. Yeah. So what I my advice to Peter was go for it. You know, what have you got to lose? Uh, as soon as you, you notice that your PSA is starting to nudge upwards, go back on the Lupron. Any, anyone and, else? Uh, wanna... you know, that, that's exactly what I did uh, about, let's see, May of last year. So it's it like 10 months ago, I decided I'm going to take a break from Lupron. And I stayed on uh, darolutamide, and I said, "Well, if I, you know, if my PSA goes up, then uh, I'll go back on the Lupron." It never went back up. All right. Well, I've I've run this by both Schultz and Turner before he left, and uh, in my local oncologist, and none of them think it's a good idea <laughs> for me. So, uh, so I did get the shot the other day. But I'm just uh, about three months from now, I might revisit it again. Just wondering if anybody's ever tried it. Why did Schultz and Turner think it was not a good idea? They felt with my last uh, my last uh, peritoneal uh, metastasis that they just uh, they're, they're they're a little more cautious. They don't they don't uh, they don't they think it's messing around where it probably Peter, Peter any... uh, remind me, are you on abiraterone? No, I'm on uh, darolutamide, Nebecca. Oh, okay. Okay. Any anyone else who's on yeah. both and wants and wants to play around? Who 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 said yes? Uh, I've got a question. I I'd like to respond to that to the uh, on the uh, Lupron issue. I don't know if it would make a difference, but I know a lot of guys go on for three month shots, or they get the six month shot. Uh, and I did one month shot, so I don't know if it makes a difference to have a uh, a more level stream rather than a high running running out then going back and getting another three month shot. Maybe maybe that helps control some of the side effects, but I have no way to compare. I really don't know. I mean, I Actually, think our experience, uh, Jimmy. I'll come. I will come to you, Jim. I think our experience has been that the men who go on the six month shots may tend to find that towards the back end of the six months, they're not getting good control of their testosterone. So but also, many of the people who are getting monthly shots, get them monthly rather than every 28 days. And towards the end of that, they're going to have more up and down swings. And then uh, potentially when they come back for the next dose, get that testosterone burst after it. So I think you're going to have a more steady state suppression with longer term, whether that's three months or six months, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but I think you'll have a better, more predictable response than doing it on a monthly basis. Right. Yeah, I had my testosterone was checked every month and it was always below 20 and it stayed, it stayed virtually non-existent throughout the 18 month course of treatment. So, so I don't know, I'm just going to uh, anticipate Carl's question, which is, you know, where does relugalix fit into this equation, right? I mean, is this going to take over? Anybody have any opinions? It seems to me a lot, you know, the trials show versus Lupron, less cardio, fewer cardiovascular side effects, equal efficacy, much faster recovery if you stop <clears> taking the pills. So, you know, Mark, you're sort of an endocrine sort of guy. What do you think? Um, I see no reason not to do that other than the finances. 
I mean, as soon as we get it worked out, if you're going to end up getting stuck with the bill for a couple of thousand dollars a month, where Lupron might be paid, I think most people will stay with uh, Lupron. Certainly, someone with a history of stroke cardiovascular disease is going to want to go uh, with the antagonist instead. And obviously, oral um, is an easier route than having to deal with shots all the time. But I think that it really depends on uh, the finances. You know, I think a lot. Of, I think some uh, some docs are a little nervous of that because we'll be controlling our own our own actions. <laughs> we won't be going in for a shot. The docs will have to write the prescriptions, and uh, we don't get wealthy giving injections. So uh, I don't see that as a uh, real problem. I think if we can simplify it, um, I think that's going to be better for everybody. Uh, let, let's just ask J Jimmy. I haven't forgotten you, but let's just ask John Ivory. You're now taking Lugalix, correct? Yeah, I've only been taking it for a week now. I am. I'm feeling more fatigue on it, but um, I'm not sure yet since it's only been a week. And also, my um, testosterone scores weren't. Uh, you know, we're still in the 40s, so I'm wondering if it does uh, take away more of my testosterone. Maybe I've just been lucky and haven't felt all the fatigue that you all have uh, with your ADT. Yep, 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 yep. So again, we're fortunate enough to have somebody actually on it, so we'll be able to monitor that as, as, as we go along. Jimmy, you had a question about this? Yes, uh, I feel like if we leave the uh, the cost of the Rubolix loan for the purpose of the discussion, just because it is so prohibitive right now, and just look at the situation. I mean, Peter, your your goal essentially cut to the chase is you want to feel a little relief. You know, you want to feel a little bit different. And what I've seen Tall Allen and some other people say is that the ex the, the degree that you're going to feel anything when you're in the situation you are and uh, is is probably not going to be very much nothing wrong with trying perhaps but i would say that maybe schultz and uh and the other doc were kind of saying the same thing like you know for what for what you're doing you can't expect to get all that much but with relugalix there is is this classic example of how it could change things because you're going to get fast drop depending on what else you're on and it's going to give you a whole different bank of information. I also want to add that your hair is pissing me off because I'm de <laughs> deeply envious. That's, a, that's an outside right. issue, but I'm deeply envious and I'm out. That's it. Right. As a, as a yeah. side note, I'm tolerating ADT very, very well. Um, and, the, and I can trace the fatigue to the new Becca rather than the, uh, than the Lupron. I've, I've experimented with that and Len and I have talked about that. So I'm I'm doing pretty good and I'm not complaining. I'm just just uh, again talking a little bit of existential stuff here. All right, um, Carl, did have we aired Relugalix enough for you? Is that what you wanted to talk about? Uh, yes, it was, and I have to say, since I'm on the East Coast, my fatigue is greatly kicking in right now, and I'm past my bedtime, but. I appreciate the discussion, and I did send an email to my oncologist. Um, I, I first heard about this medication earlier today from the, the Zero Cancer Summit, who some of you may have been listening to, and uh, they did talk about that, and, and the benefits, the cardiac effects are much better than uh, being on the Lupron. So when I went uh, to send the email, to my oncologist, he quickly sent back. He said, I said, well, should I not go on it? My six month Lupron is, is coming uh, up in April. And he simply said, sure, we'll need to work on approval. So I'm not sure exactly what that is. And he did copy the head pharmacist for the Cancer Institute on his, his response. So that's where so, I'm at. A couple of things. Did you say the first time you heard about it was today? Yes. Okay, well, we've been, we've been talking about it in this group for probably the last three months on a pretty regular basis because John Ivory has got it from Alicia Morgans and we've, we've discussed it regularly. 
at, at that's, various that's times during the opinion. meeting. Not <laughs> that's my only at the end. Not, okay, it's not only at the end, but you can go back and, and listen. Now, we've also discussed in this meeting that um, you can get two months free with no problem. So you can always get that there's a, there's a there's a program that um, um, uh, I've just lost the name. What's the name of the What's the name of the uh, the maker, J John, with an M? M, M, M what's Myovan. the name of the people? Myovan. Myovan. Thank, thank you. The, the Myovan has a program where you can easily get two months free, so you can try it for two months, if, if and then you can always go back. But it is a it is an antagonist. So you, you don't have to worry about um, getting any shot before it. You've already been on, you've been on um, an agonist anyway, and you're coming in with low testosterone. But, you know, you can definitely get two months and then maybe they can get it for you. I mean, certainly John Ivory has gotten the proof. But we have been discussing it at length, guys. Isn't that right? Somebody else support me on this? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure I've it six months I'm sure ago. I've brought it up many times. Yeah. Well, as I yeah. said, my my fatigue is greatly kicking in right now, so <laughs> that's why I don't like. Hey, Rick, I've got one. I've got one question. Uh, hold on a minute. What did you say, Carl? No, that that was um, that was somebody else that just said he has one question. Yeah. No. What did you just say? That's because something. No, I said that's why I don't I don't like being left until the end because I'm on the East Coast and this is way past my bedtime and my fatigue is yeah, overwhelming. Well, Carl, last week you were right up front and a lot of times you're in the middle and we don't always leave you to always leave you to the end and we've got a lot of guys who are on the East Coast on here. So somebody's got to be at the back end. We're sorry it was you today. Yes, David. One one fast question for Len. Len. Yeah. When and what what precipitated your holiday on Lupron and sticking with darolutamide? Because that kind of answers Peter's. You know, it's all part of what Peter asked. What made what made you do that? And did you have yeah. support of your docs? Yeah, I, I told uh, my oncologist that I was experiencing some <clears throat> shortness of breath uh, when when exercising, and I thought it might be the Lupron. Uh, because once before I was on Lupron for about a year and I had the same symptom. Uh, so I just wanted to see, was it a cardiovascular issue or was it the Lupron? Uh, so that's, that's the main reason I stopped. And then you just stayed off of it. And then I stayed off. Yeah. The last, uh, since May of, of last year. And your PSA is, is still very, very low. Very low, yeah, uh, less than zero point zero six. Beautiful. How's, how's your shortness of breath, Len? Is it better now that you're off the Lebron? It, it was for many months, but then I started getting it again. And Peter and I were talking about that as well. Sometimes we, uh, even after taking the darolutamide, we we feel uh, fatigued. But uh, that, anyway, that's a bit controversial um, because it takes four hours for darolutamide to reach peak plasma concentration. So it didn't make sense that we would feel fatigue within minutes after taking it. So anyway, I'm trying to make an appointment with a cardio oncologist to, uh, to see if it's my heart. Oh, guys, that reminds me. Um... On Wednesday at eight o'clock, this station, this channel, um, the active surveillance guys are having a cardio a cardiologist from um, the Canadian hospital, uh, Mc, McMartin, is it? What's it? Herb, what's the what's the university? McMaster. McMaster. McMaster, McMaster, McMaster is in Hamilton, Ontario, I think. Right. So they've got a, supposedly a really good guy. He's going to come in and Howard said, do we want him to talk a little bit about metabolic syndrome? And I said, well, we haven't had a chance to advertise it to our guys. 
because he didn't. He told me after we sent out the um, the reminder this week. That said, if some of you want to come on to that call, and I see you on that call, because I'll be there, I will tell Howard, ask Howard if he can allow for some questions from some of my other, some of our other guys. This is a cardiologist who has really made specialty of studying prostate cancer patients. Okay. So eight, eight uh, o'clock Eastern time. Eight o'clock Eastern time on in this room, Baniscus room on Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, they have the active surveillance guys dedicate one meeting a month to a presentation out of three and this this month they're having this um this cardiologist daryl leong i think his name is and they they met with him today for a pre-meeting and they said he was just awful so i i will send um howard a note because i think he's going to moderate looks like he's just he looks like he's just come back from some distant shtetl in 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 lithuania right now um, he's got this long streaky beard and he, he says he's not getting <laughs> haircut or shaving until COVID is over. But, um, ha but I'll let Howard know that we may have a couple of more advanced guys and they may have some questions about their situation. The, the guy has already said he's happy to um, take questions from you, but please be advised that it's basically an active surveillance oriented presentation so don't get frustrated with that but but you're welcome to attend can i ask okay. someone who does join that meeting to ask about using the estrogen patch and see what his take is on that um i mean by all means come in the meeting and ask him please um or um oh and it will be recorded so um Yes, I mean, we, we can definitely ask him about that. I, I'm making a note right here, and I will, I will um, funny enough, that's, that was what I said to them when they said, because we were talking about estradiol, I'd just been talking about estradiol with, uh, with um, Eleni, and so we, I, I had mentioned that as a possible question, but yes, we'll, we'll try and cover that, and maybe, Len, we can cover your issue. Um, and see if he's ever noted any relationship between between an LHRH drug and, and, and loss of breath. I mean, I do know, I remember this goes back a long time, that um, Flomax um, is noted to cause uh, some, some pulmonary issues, that men who are on Flomax do tend to sub and do tend to get out of breath, and it has been noted, and it, it, it's in the literature. I remember that from from some years ago. What what is um what is the name of the what's the uh, medical name of Flomax, Len? Uh, uh, Amsilocin. Right. I mean, Amsilocin. I'm taking it. It's interesting. I'm now taking it, and I'm feeling a little more out of breath than before my radiation. So perhaps it's associated. Yeah, it is. And you should talk talk to your guy at the NIH. Talk to one of your guys at the NIH about that because it is noted and they never tell you. Hmm. And they'll say, oh, yeah, it's really, well, it is on the label or something like that. Hey, quickly, okay. guys, what's the deal with statins? Is it just a kind of a might not, it can't hurt and might help thing? And metformin, they're both thought of that way. Is that right? Well, metformin can hurt you. Okay, metformin what about statins? Metformin is not without danger. Okay, statins? What is? Statins, what about statins? Let me, let me just statins say- are, Some people say you should put statins in the drinking water. Right, what right. do you think? I, I, it's a big anti-inflammatory drug, it works. And the only problem is you, some people get really mu bad muscle pain. Mm. Yeah. Can, can, we, okay. can we raise this, Jimmy? Just 
keep it in yeah. your pipe because I hate to talk about metformin and statins just quickly. No, I understand, and I'd love to. Some, some other time, yeah. There are pros and cons, and yes, metformin can hurt you. But that's probably because you're taking too much of it, as Jake will attest. And if you I'd, I'd the, love to talk to about it sometime. Okay, we'll come everyone. back. We'll Good come. Work. We'll come back to it, and and just know that metformin is controversial, just as just as statins are. Look what right. told me, so watch out for Lipitor. I could barely walk far at all once I started taking it. It was terrible. Watch out. <laughs> yeah. I'm being right. called away. I want to say good night to everybody and thank you. I'm going to have a dilated smoothie and go to bed. <laughs> I love you all. Good night. Good night, Jimmy. Okay. I hope you get to use that button very soon. Bye. <laughs> It's coming my way. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. It's it, we're twenty minutes over. Wasn't supposed to happen that way, but it did. And we've got some. Um, we and, and we finished up with some grouchy people, but um, they'll be back, I suspect. That's that. That's life. Um, Len and, and and Peter and Herb, if you just want to hold on for a couple of seconds, that'd be great. And okay. we've got all kinds of things going on that right now on metformin. Um, we'll talk about statins and metformin next time. And um, that's it. We're done for the night. No, next week. Next week is Tuesday, six o'clock, with Peter Kafka in the chair. Okay, right. all the way from Maui. Okay. So right. this station, and don't forget the Wednesday meeting if you would like to be there. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Good night, guys. Take care. Have a good, good night. night everybody. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good, good night. night. Thanks for having me back, Rick. Oh, Skip, we're delighted to have you, and we're going to put you to work for Ancan. I've just got to figure out the right job yeah. for you. Well, I have to. I have to catch up. It's been a while, you know. <laughs> we'll give you. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Thank and, you for and, and, and nice to. See Nice to see you again, Carlos. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> yes. Please. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um.